This episode of the In Focus series features Melina Young. Melina is a former Muay Thai fighter and owner and operator of Fightsis and nationally registered fighters. Hello, <laughs> welcome to Hi. the show. Hello, Melina. Hello. Thank you. Let's start off with this photo right here. I believe this was my first time meeting you, right? Yes, and yeah. this was my first time in to state, I think, too. My first time. Well, yeah. this is my first time meeting you, and I think we already knew of each other through the social realms. And I work, what's well, no secret, I work closely with Synergy and the Rebellion team doing all the designs, photography, and especially at weigh-ins. I do a lot of work prepping the weigh-in stuff because some people might not know that doing weigh-ins is almost as much work as doing the show mm. itself, getting all the paperwork done, doing all the ticketing, um, on the promotional side of the things, taking photos of the fighters, so using that for marketing material for future shows. It's a good time for myself to also get to know the fighters, get to know the people, and you see, you see all sorts of fighters come through. This was a road to rebellion, so you had first-time fighters to your travelling fighters and then your pro fighters. So you get seasoned fighters coming in, but also your first time is showing a bit of nerves. So I like to try and calm them down, talk to people, try and catch up with them. And it was a great, it was a great first meeting with yourself. What do you remember from this event being your first time on a rebellion show and first time in a state? So I was, um, I remember being quite nervous coming down because it was my first interstate fight. Um, I had only sort of just started NRF at this point too. So I kind of felt extra pressure coming down there um, thinking, you know, oh, you know, I've got a lot of members that are down in Melbourne and I really have to prove myself. Otherwise they're going to think I don't know what I'm talking about when I'm trying to match fights and that kind of thing. Um, and it's a little bit funny, but I was a bit of a fangirl of yours then as well so I was really nervous the fact that you were going to be taking photos and I was sort of thinking oh I want to make sure I perform good so I don't shit me photos. <laughs> Your opponent was Tessa from Hammer's Gym and I think she had a big support team from Hammer. Did you know much about your opponent at the time? Yeah, I'd actually just fought her sister, um, uh, I think it was about four weeks beforehand, um, and that was me and her sister's second fight. Um, and I also knew her partner at the time, it was Chris Harrington. Um, so, and obviously I know knew of Hammer, so I knew that gym was quite strong. Um, so it was a little bit, um, yeah, stressful to come down and, and know that I was coming up against someone that was quite tough. How many fights have you had at this stage and what was it like travelling for your first interstate fight? Uh, I think I must have had maybe eight or nine by then. I really can't remember. Um, and I, I really found, I mean, obviously it was really exciting to come down and be on um, Rebellion too because, you know, it was it is Australia's biggest show. So I um, was, you know, quite nervous about putting on a good performance and also wanting to put on a good fight for Cy because um, I know Cy likes to have, you know, really good quality fights on his shows too. So I, I, I didn't want to let him down as well. Um, but yeah, and no, I just remember when I got into the ring, I remember sort of walking around to seal the ring and just thought, oh, I've got to look out, out at the crowd and not be kind of so scared to know that there's a crowd out there. Um, and yeah. at the same time, again, because I was interstate, I was like, okay, I'm coming from interstate. So, you know, it's not like I'm not, no one's going to know who I am. Everyone's going to be cheering for Tessa. Um, and also, as I said before too, because of NRF, I was really nervous about, you know, putting on a crap fight um, for, for the way it may affect my members and my business. So it was, I've kind of put a little bit extra pressure on myself by having- Were you more nervous about that business aspect more than the fight itself? Yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of probably at the top of my list of, of in order of fights. I, I don't tend to get too nervous before fights. Um, I've sort of learnt a way around to- change my nerves into excitement. So um, every time I fought, I was really excited rather than being nervous. Um, but yeah, the, the pressure of knowing that I was interstate, that kind of was a little bit daunting for me. And especially being at this um, tight knit venue, it's a very low, uh, tight venue at the Melbourne Town Hall where you can see everyone in the crowd, you can see everyone's mm. faces, you can see their reactions. So I suppose that you would have been thinking about that as well when Del was watching you fight. Yeah, and it's also it was an absolutely beautiful venue, like the roof and my favorite the side. Venue. Yeah, it's so beautiful. When I remember walking out there and just looking and just being all, like, I've never fought in anything that is as beautiful as that looked as well. So yeah, it was awesome, and and I felt very excited to be able to um, go in there and sort of say, "Hey, Melbourne, 
this is me, you know, this is what I'm doing and, you know, why I love the industry so much and why I want to be a part of it outside of fighting as well. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was awesome. That's awesome. I remember we had a, we had a promotional photo shoot at Traugen a few years later and then I was asking you to do a flying knee and you, and you said to me, oh, I can't do one. But looking back at the photos, I almost forgot, I got this jumping knee of you right here. <laughs> it's one of those things that like, if someone tells me to do it on cue, I always yep. forget how to do it. I'm the same with a Superman punch as well. I'm, I'm always get, my head gets in the one. I'm like, oh, I, I don't know how to do it. But if I just do it, you know, on the fly, literally um, <laughs> it, it comes together <laughs> did the fight play out to how you were thinking about how it was going to play out in your head um i guess the the way i kind of we worked things with my trainer he kind of comes up with his game plan um himself and he usually gets me in the ring he'll tell me obviously certain things that he wants me to work on um but he'll usually play out first round and this is usually with opponents too when people haven't you know when you're not pros yet people haven't had that many fights he'll usually wait for round one just kind of feel it out and then we come back into the corner and he'll then have go into game plan mode and tell me what he wants done during the fight so um before the fight i didn't really have in my for myself i didn't have any sort of game plan ahead of time um and yeah as semi trainer Richard Walsh, he, he kind of feels it out as it goes along as well. So he, he would have had a game plan in his head that yep. didn't let me in on it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we, and we're very, um, our gym kind of, we like to work a lot on knees as well. So um, I had just, when I'd beaten her sister four weeks beforehand, um, I had was quite dominant with knees. So I kind of thought, you know, I wouldn't mind throwing in some good knees there as well. And I think it's good for every fighter to learn early on, you know, your natural attributes, what works for you. Don't try and force the start that's not meant for you. Mm, yeah, agree. And I guess also that's the other thing too. I didn't like to myself, I didn't like to study my opponents or know too much about them beforehand. I would put all that trust in my trainer and I would always, he would just tell me, okay, you're fighting on this date. I'd just go, okay, whatever you control that. So he would know what to do and he, we would train things according to his game plan in training um but he wouldn't be like you know oh she's going to do this so you're going to do this he mm. would just work on specific things with me and that's what we trained and this was quite early on so um again you know you're still building yourself as a fighter anyway so you're not really set into any kind of style or or anything at that point point. and i suppose at that level like under 10 fights it's all about experience that's right yeah exactly and as my trainer said you know he said even when you get sort of above 10 fights um and heading towards 20 fights you're still not even really set into yourself as a you know establishing your style by then you're still kind of you know each fight you try something different you know this worked or this didn't work or you know i really liked doing that and you know i'd like to get better at you know this side of things and i think maybe when you get to kind of above 20 fights you're sort of then starting to fall into a rhythm and you know you start to build yourself into what style you I guess your you know works for you. Out of curiosity, how long into your training did you have your first fight? Oh, I've trained for ages. I trained for four years before I had my first fight. Um, when I first started training, which was in 2004, I actually didn't even know that fighting was a thing. Like, like I was friends with the fighters at the gym, but in my mm. head it was a thing that they did. It wasn't something that the public could do kind of thing. I know that sounds really weird, but, um, and I especially never even thought of it as a sport that females did. Um, yeah. And then I kind of traveled a little bit. And, um, when I got back, um, my trainer just sort of threw me in there and I was like, Oh, can I, is that something I can do? Is that even an option? <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that was back then too. Like yeah. just the other year at Melbourne, we had an all female pro fight card and it's something you wouldn't see 10 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what you find now is a lot of the main events are, are females or you'll have, you know, the main events, semi main. And, um, you know, if there are two semi mains that they're usually all females as well and they draw a big crowd. Yeah. That's really good to see that. You were speaking about all the pressure you had on this fighting on, on this fight because you're brand new business and your first interstate fight. What did it feel like to have your hands being raised at this moment? Uh, it was a really awesome feeling. I, um, I remember sort of just sitting there and kind of being so relieved that I, I didn't let the pressure get to me too much with everything else. Um, but I mean, by the time I get in the ring, I kind of, that's all out the window anyway. And I'm, I'm there in the moment and doing what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I just remember being really like happy and I'm always, I don't know why, but every time I fight, I'm always surprised if I win, even if I 
win dominantly, I still am surprised that I win. I, it's a really weird thing that I'm always sort of like, oh, oh I won, because I think when I'm fighting, I've kind of, I'm not really thinking about, oh, I'm going, I'm winning this. I'm kind of just going, okay, I, I need to do what I'm doing and keep doing it and pushing it hard and doing, you know, throwing everything out there every round. And then by the end of the fight, sometimes I don't even know it's the end of the fight and my trainer has to tell me, you know, no, that was the last round. And I'm like, no. oh, <laughs> stop now. <laughs> So yeah, it's a it's a really good feeling. That's awesome. Moving forward a few years, we find ourselves here in Turagan, top deck promotions, and one of it was one of the coldest nights for memory. Mm. I, I don't know why, why I chose that month, but a fighter friend of mine, Albert Xavier, it, him and his mates promoted the show, and he asked me to be on board. At first, I was quite reluctant because it was a long drive. Yeah, I was whining a little bit, but then I thought, you know what? I love the sport. I like Albert. I'll go and support him. And it turned out to be a really good night. And you were also featured fighting on his card too. Having all the experiences you've had fighting in Australia, what's it like for you accepting fights on a brand new promotion? Um, I think, again, it's that was something that my trainer always handled. I didn't ever have anything to do with, you know, what show it was or who I was fighting. Um, that was all left to... Richie um but I mean we already knew Albie we knew the gym that he came from we um Richie knew his trainer um quite well um from you know because Richie was from Melbourne himself um so you know he, he knew the area and um that kind of thing and we went and trained at um Albie's gym at the time um what's his trainer's name again I forgot That's yeah yeah so we went and t- trained there when we were warming up and everything before before the show or before weigh in sorry yeah um yeah, so I mean, it. I guess that wasn't an issue. They had marketed it really well as well, so um, it didn't look like a two-bit show. It, they had done it, marketed it quite professionally. Um, so, you know, I think Richie was was happy to put us on that. Um, and also, the opponent, um, Kim Alina, is was a very highly respected fighter in Melbourne and you know she's a crowd favorite so again it was a very good level fighter it wasn't like we were sort of coming down to fight yeah you know a random person um so um yeah Richie could saw that as a good opportunity for me also before this fight happened we had our little promotional photo shoot just backstage at the venue and you're one of the few fighters that understands the the advantages of having proper promotional photography to promote yourself as a fighter but also your business as well yeah Is that so you've always had in the back of your mind um i think through what i did with my business um i and because i also had a lot of sponsors on board too i knew the importance of um promoting your sponsors um so like punish were my sponsors so obviously i wanted to get myself in their gear promoting my gym as well with um my top um and also wanting to be able to do what I do with my business is making all the um, kind of promotional images for my members. Um, I I was able to be able to use um, my images as demonstrations and that kind of thing as well. Um, The real reason behind why I did it though (laughs) was because I knew you were going to be there. And so I thought to myself, I'm not wasting this opportunity because this is something I want to remember for the rest of my life. Um, And, you know, years down the track, I want to be able to have captured you know, what I was able to do. So that I just jumped at the opportunity. And I remember as soon as I knew that you were taking photos, I was like, I'm booking in a photo shoot with you. Cause I'd seen the previous profile photos you'd done of other people and the action shots, you know. Yeah. The, but um, there was a lot of pressure on me too. They were all taken on, on days off, but it was my first time shooting somebody before a show. So it was a lot of pressure on me to make things be as smooth as possible to not interfere with your mental preparation for your game. So I was actually very nervous <laughs> trying not to just drop your flow, but you made it very easy i was going to say that's probably i was probably the easiest person because i don't really have much of a mental preparation before a fight i'm i'm always really excited to fight so to me it's it's like a fun thing to do so i don't things like that don't interrupt my mental flow especially i mean the only thing that i kind of do before a fight is i do isolate myself from distractions of people Mm. but because this was sort of work related fight related and it was nothing that i had to think hard about um, yeah, it was actually something fun to do when it kind of relaxed me before the fight, which was really good. Yeah, it was fun and very relaxing. On the topic of your fighter, you did mention you were fighting a local favourite, Kim Elena Baldacino, and you actually fought outside the comfort zone fighting K1 rules 
a local girl and she was actually from Trigon, so she had a lot of fans yeah. out there too. What was it like switching your style to K1 for that night? Yeah, so it was, um, we had to really change my training because, you know, lock on and knee is a big thing that um, I have always trained and had, mm. that had always been a big strength of mine in my fights. So we had to do a lot of training of, you know, one hand, let go um, with your knees. I actually found that after this fight, it took me a while to try to get back into doing a two-handed clinch and knee. Um, and also I think... Um, I, I probably fought more, still more Muay Thai style. I didn't really, I guess, go with the scoring points that are more scoring for K1. Um, but, yeah, it was still still a great fight to have and against someone like Kemalina was, was awesome. Did you have any more K1 fights after that? And did you learn anything about uh, a completely different sport after that? Um, I didn't have any more K1 fights Um but it did um, spark my interest in K1 a little bit more and it made me kind of watch a little bit more K1 style fights. And also it helped me with my business to be able to open up other Muay Thai fighters' minds to be to sort of say to them, look, you know, there is a K1 opportunity for you if you want this fight and to sort of explain to them, look, you know, you, you, you can do it just because it's K1 doesn't mean, and you're Muay Thai doesn't mean you can't do it if there is a fight opportunity. I think that's the biggest thing with Muay Thai fighters too. And, especially, and you can say for yourself, you've done that yourself. So you can actually use yourself as an example. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I guess it also kind of makes you realise to with K1, the importance of point scoring. Because that, I guess, is a little bit different to Muay Thai where they can score on different kind of aspects depending on who's what the judges are looking at. Um, but yeah, with K1, I think it's more, more about, you know, racking up the points there. As, out of curiosity, what is the K1 scene like in Queensland? Because I feel like in Melbourne, it varies from show to show and rep to rep, depending on who's there in the night. There's always yeah. a bit of discretion in the rules and you won't know until you get to the centre ring and you hear the crowd screaming at you and then hear the, you hear the ref saying a few slight differences and then you, you turn to your trainer and you think, what, I thought it was one hand. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in Queensland, it's not not a not huge. Muay Thai is bigger um, and MMA, uh, but K1 fights that you might get find the odd one on a promotion that allows all styles. So when you've got the mixed styles, um, I mean, it's not there are K1 fights there, but they're not. Yeah, they're definitely not big. Um, Waco were running um, some shows up in Queensland, but I'm not sure when they sort of do more the tournament style. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I think more people that want to do K1 will, will look at doing tournaments more than, you know, fight, full fight shows. Awesome. Now, shortly after this fight, you went backstage and then you came right back out because your teammate, Dwayne Harris, was also fighting that night. I think he fought Muay Thai, so good for him. Yeah. Yeah, and it's pretty cool because I've been to his gym, uh, World Fitness Cartel, a few times, and I'm pretty honoured to see him putting up some of my pictures of him on the wall yeah. too, so that was very cool. What's it like walking out backstage with your teammate and also just being in a corner with your teammate. Yeah, it was really good it, because I, I still had the adrenaline and excitement from, um, you know, being at the show. So to be able to bring that into his corner as well and, um, you know, I guess give him that um, encouragement and support. Um, it's a good feeling to be able to, you know, be there for him because it was only us. Um, we did have uh, some of the boys from another gym in Queensland corporate box that they kind of helped out on my fight because Dwayne was out back prepping um, for his. So that was really good to have, you know, people in your corner and people that you know and trust as well, because, you know, we had done fight camp together and cut weight together and, you know, we were really good mates. So yeah, it was good to be in his corner. Have you done much cornering work and do you have any set duties that you normally do or is that normally up to Richie? Uh, it's usually up to Richie. I didn't like really being in the corner. Um, I did go in the corner a couple of times, but I, I get really panicky because I just don't want to stuff it up. So I'm always, um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, quick, get the bucket, quick, get this in my, in my head. So I'm kind of like, um, yeah, I will only go in the corner if it's one of my uh, good friends and they've asked me to go into the corner. Um, but usually I'm just doing, Richie tells me what to do. And yeah, I'm, I'm not an awesome cornerman. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose because it was an interstate fight and you had a very small team, you were the water girl and the timekeeper and towel girl and all that. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And I remember it was so, like you said, it was so cold at this show. Oh, it was. Um, Everyone just, after to... the fight, I just wore the hoodies and long pants again because it was yeah. that freezing. Before the fight, Dwayne and I couldn't get warm because in the, out the back where all the fighters were, it was a big, that big open basketball court. Um, and so, because it was so huge and so open, we just couldn't get warm. I was wearing my hoodie. I was yeah. wearing Richie's hoodie, um, track pants, uh, you know, I had a beanie on and we still couldn't get warm. We ended up finding the janitor's closet where they had all the brooms and everything stored and we locked ourselves in there and shut the door and Dwayne and I um, warmed up in there because it was the only place we could get warm. I like um, you. As soon as you came out, yeah, yeah, it was freezing when we came out and then um, finally the other fighters had kind of moved out of the dressing room that was behind the stage there so we were able to move into there closer to our fights which was good. It's like I feel for the ties when they come into Melbourne during August, that coldest month of the year, and you see them backstage wearing layers and layers of clothing, hoodies and track pants and socks, just trying to keep warm. It's yeah, it's almost so it's such so, so foreign for them. It was really hard to cut weight as well because I was doing. Um, we did the sauna first, um, but the last little bit I was just going to do a bath cut. Um, but by the time, you know, you get into the bath, staying there for 10 minutes, by the time you get out just to dry off to put your sweatsuit back on, you're already cold. So cutting weight kind of was a little bit harder to do, get that last little bit off just because it was so cold. I ended up having to put the heater on in the bedroom. I got into the single bed, had two doona covers on with my sweatsuit on and I was running, laying down in the bed, oh. just running on my, laying on my side. I've never heard anyone doing that before. <laughs> It must have looked hilarious, but yeah. it worked. <laughs> hilarious. Now, moving up north, we have this cool little school hall venue at Siam to Sydney put on by Andy Parnham. I think it's one of my favourite little venues. It's always good to yeah. work with Andy and, and the team for these kind of shows. It was a very good scrap between you and Leonie Max for a WMC title. It was a very stacked flight night too. There was plenty of titles on the line. Very tight family style show what was the experience like on this one so this was one of my very favorite fights um i had had about uh, about i had about a year out of the ring i'd had uh seven months out of training um so i was so excited to fight leone and i were booked to fight um i think a, a year before that but i'd broken my nose just before our fight in one of a previous fight. So um, we had to cancel that fight. So it was exciting to be able to finally get to face Leone. Um, and she's such a well-known and respected fighter that I was just really happy to be able to have this opportunity. Again, same as you said, I, I do love Andy Parnham. So to be able to be on his show also was awesome to work with really good people. Um, so, yeah, I remember coming out for this fight and I was just like, stupidly excited i just remember i was walking around the ring sealing the ring and i'd look yeah. like a kid at christmas i was just kind of yeah just really overexcited just to be back in the ring because as i said it had been a year since i'd been in there and um this was yeah really like you said it was a cool venue too you know it's got that uh, mezzanine level that you're looking straight yeah. at and i had family fly down to sydney and i had family already in sydney so it was really awesome to be able to see friends and family i hadn't seen in ages too and people that i knew that lived in sydney that hadn't been able to get to watch me fight before um yeah and also it was added bonus that it was for an australian title so yeah that was really cool it was also one of those venues where it's very small you can hear and see everybody around you did that add to the excitement of it too because at that time leonie was a crowd uh, uh sydney girl yes yeah yeah and, and it, she's a huge, huge sydney favorite um i mean that to me though because i already I, I knew Leonie, we weren't that close, but I knew her. Um, she was also one of my NRF members. So that kind of, <laughs> I was like, oh, I was going to punch one of my members. But um, that kind of, I think, even though the crowd were there for her, I kind of didn't sort of feel that as anything nerve wracking. Um, like you said, because it was so, you could see everything at the top. I, my family were sitting right at the front of that mezzanine level. Um, so it was really cool to be able to see them and when I was sealing the ring, I noticed a friend of mine standing on the side of the, it was at the back of the venue, but you know, it was that close that I hadn't seen him in years. And so it was so awesome. I turned around, I was like, Oh, he's here. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, it makes it more exciting when, when people are up close and, you know, like you said, you can see everybody. It, it yeah. really adds to the, um, to the adrenaline rush for it, I guess. Just on that note, while you were being active fighter and you were running NRF, you would have had a large starter base of fighters and, 
seeing who's fighting who. And oftentimes you'll be fighting some members yourself. What is that experience like? I'm sure no one else in Australia would ever experience something like that. It's, um, it's, it's a little bit weird sometimes when you're having to match like your own fight, but I would try to kind of push that through Richie more. Um, but because I always had a lot of respect for my opponents, I've, I'm not a, one of those sort of um, disrespectful people before fights or anything like that. Um, so it, 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 it was never an issue. And generally, um, it, there were people I knew and were friends with anyway before we fought just from, you know, travelling around and talking to people. So it, it kind of adds to the excitement because it's more fun because, you know, you're both there to do a job. You both want to punch each other. And you're both allowing each other to punch each other. So there's no, it's never anything that's kind of hostile, mm. you know, because you're not sitting there going, oh, you bitch, you just punched me. <laughs> you, plus you, like, have, you, know, you have all the dirt on them because you have the records, you know exactly what, where they train, what they do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, that, and that's what's good. But again, you know, I didn't ever, even though I knew their records and that kind of thing, I wouldn't go, if I was going to fight someone, I wouldn't go study their fight or anything. As I said, I leave that to that's Richie's job. Um, I'm just more focused on training really hard and, and going out there and doing the best that I can do. For myself, shooting this event, it's always a bit difficult watching friends fight. And I remember watching you fight and then like you said, you were just so excited to be there. Even after the fight, <laughs> you were cut, but you were still walking back towards me because it was a smile, walking back to the corner. Like you it just seemed like you were just over the moon to be at that, that event. Yeah. <laughs> I was having a great old time. So what, what, this is going to sound really weird, but one of the things on my bucket list was I wanted to, I wanted to know what it was like to fight with blood in your eye. Like, so I wanted to know what that, I know that's really weird, but I just wanted to know what that experience felt like. Yeah. Um, and to yourself, what it looks like through those eyes. Cause I'd never been cut, you know, right over my eye like that before. The only other time I'd been cut was um, like 10 seconds left of the fight. And another injury I had was a broken nose. Again, it was like a 10 seconds left of the fight. So I'd never fought with an injury or anything for very long. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. When, someone when that happened, I was someone like, who's oh, listening yeah. and doesn't fight, what's it like to have blood in your eyes? Um, so it's, it, everything kind of goes red. Like you can just sort of see red through, through your eye. But I was in my head, I was like, well, I've got another eye. I'll just use the other eye. <laughs> um, and so, um, that, and it just gets a little bit warm. So, but it didn't actually bother. You can't feel anything anyway because you've got so much adrenaline, so it didn't hurt. Um, but it was just a really weird sensation to have that warm feeling in your eye. Um, and then, so I was kind of, I was like, okay, right, she's got me. So I'm trying to like charge in, trying <laughs> to get to her. But um, because Leonie knew she would, you know, because of the damage she'd done, she kind of just kept running away from me around the ring, like, as in, you know, not as in running away scared, but running away as like, nah, you're not coming near me because I cut you, like these kind of things. So that was really fun, you know, to play with her like yeah. that in the ring as well because I was like, come here. And she's like, nope, nope. <laughs> That's a very common <laughs> side of my time. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Now, I've got to say backstage photos is one of my favourite styles of photos to get, maybe more so than the fight itself. And because it shows the more intimate side of the sport that most fans can never see. And it's always challenging for me to navigate my way around the ring, to go to backstage, finding out where the blue corner is, where the red corner is, finding out where I can be, and just trying to find something nice to showcase the fighters to the fans and people. Uh, and it's always challenging not to knock over anything like tie oil yeah. or shake hands with people that's got tie oil on, on their gloves or hands. What yeah. goes through your mind backstage and do you have any kind of rituals? Um, I'm not really a ritual person. Uh, one thing I am kind of renowned for doing, which isn't a good thing, is I sometimes have a little nap and <laughs> I get a little bit too relaxed. <laughs> um, so we've had to kind of try to stop me from doing that a little bit so that because a couple and probably two fights, I've actually not realised that I was fighting and was woken up. <laughs> and is that, oh, every, is that every show? Um, most shows I'm usually laying out back with my earphones in. I, I just tend to, if I'm usually only if I'm fighting really late, usually, you know, if I'm the main event or semi main or, you know, later in the card that I have to do that. Um, I don't tend to watch fights before my fight. Um, I will tend to, yeah, just sit at the back and kind of prepare myself. Um, but there, this venue here, cause 
like you were saying before, when you're trying to go out back, this venue's got that so many little nooks and crannies where people can be, yeah. you know, how you go downstairs to get to this area or you can go out back and there's that little strip and, you know, there's kind of people in little different yeah. areas. Um, so that was really cool um, to be there. But, um, you yeah, know, I didn't have any rituals though. I kind of, what I was doing here in this photo is um, sewing my sponsor patch on my shorts at the time because we weren't supposed to put sponsor patches on, but I put my own little sewing kit and did it. <laughs> did you tell me about that? <laughs> I did. Oh. <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what we were doing there. And uh, Marcus had come down to help corner me, which was really nice of him to fly down with Richie. Um, but, yeah, I kind of more just sort of chill out with my team. And um, I remember we were waiting for, to come out for our fight. Um, and the fight before ours was the one with... Was it Lee Fook when it was really, really bloody fight? There was like blood everywhere. I don't know whether it was when Lee was elbowing the guy in the top of the head and or it was just a really, it might not have been his fight maybe, I can't remember. But anyway, it was like extremely bloody. And so when we were waiting at the back, the, the boys walked past us and they were uh, just covered in I blood. I think that was Andy's boy Cam Webb against Jesse. Oh, is that who it was? Jesse. That was a bloody fight. Yeah, it was like hectic and... Um, some people were kind of looking at me going, oh, well, you know, are you a bit worried now that they've come out all bloody? But I was like, no, nah, I'm super excited just to get in there. Like, it doesn't kind of phase me. You know, it's a sport and we, we know that that's always a possibility. And yeah, it was because then I got cut in the eye. <laughs> it was a very nice cut, though. It made for a nice photo. <laughs> now, so. after a while as a photographer, you have a mental shot list of photos that you take and it just it just goes from my mind helps me set up the shots set up the fights nicely and i like these kind of they like these pre-fight photos because at this stage you know the gloves are taped you sealed the ring there's no turning back you're moments away from touching gloves and having a battle are there any last words of advice you get from your coach during these kind of moments he always tells me before what like the last thing he always says is that go in there and have fun he always says that every single fight and I always do, you know, so um, that's his biggest thing. Always, always taps me on the back and goes, come here, give, us some, give me some love, go out there and have fun. And um, I love that because, you know, you go in there and you're really relaxed and, um, no pressure. you know, you, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, I, I don't know if it would work. I'm probably not the kind of person that would go in there or oh, you better win or, you know, that's sort of a mentality wouldn't really work for me. I was mm. kind of more about getting in there and yeah, having a good time, but also being able to put on display what things that I've learned over the years. And um, yeah, so that kind of moment there is the last thing he says and I would turn around and then as soon as I look at my opponent, then I'm game on. I know it's go. Yep. And I think one of the things I like about Muay Thai more than other fight sports is the amount of respect shown to each both fighters after a fight, more so than other styles. And I think sometimes more so in girls and in guys. And you've been involved in fight sports across different styles for a long time in your business. Is that something that you notice too? Yes, 100%. Um, I find Muay Thai, um, there's less, sorry for the language, but there's a shit talking beforehand. I mean, there still are people that do it, but um, it, there's less of that. And then afterwards, you know, everyone does show, most people, I should say, majority of people show a lot more respect than, you know, what I have seen in other sports um, or martial arts anyway. You know, some MMA, kickboxing, boxing, you know, it all kind of, there tends to be more people in there that sort of get the shits more maybe. <laughs> well, I think most, for, the most, for the most part, most Thai boxers, they know they're, don't know what their opponent went through too, or the rounds of pads or the sparring or the clinching or the bad work or the road work going into it. And after the fight, I think they're both glad that it's over and they can just embrace in that moment. That's right. And that's exactly what I think is, you know, you, you know, hey, we've just gone something through something really, really intense together. Um, and we've both come out of this, you know, still standing and, you know, that's always awesome. Like, yeah. it's a really good feeling. And I remember after the fight with Leone, um, we both couldn't stop thanking each other because, you know, we both respected each other. Um, and from that, we've now, we're like really good mates now. She moved up to the Gold Coast and, you know, came and worked at my gym. So now she's like a big part of our gym. And, um, yeah, we see each other all the time. So that's like, you know, I've just made a really good friend out of someone cutting my eye. <laughs> 
You wouldn't hear it anywhere else, Elena. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I always tell people the only way to make friends is to punch them in the face. <laughs> it's very logical. On that topic about networking and both our behind the scenes work, can you talk a little bit about NRF, how it started, what inspired you to create that and some of the success stories and challenges that you've had along the way? So um, I started NRF. So back when I had, it was my a third fight, I think it was, I had people pulling out injuries and just not wanting to fight or whatever um, on like fight week before weigh in. So I started to get really upset that, you know, you, you've trained so hard and then you have your opponent pull out. It's, it's heart wrenching because, you know, you just put in so much effort. And back then there weren't, a hit that, that wasn't like females were fighting, but they, you know, it definitely wasn't because that was in 2008. Mm. Um, so yeah, that wasn't, huge with females um and so i was doing it back then so um doing network desktop server support um and some little bit of web development as well um so i kind of thought to myself there has to be other girls out there at my weight that are having the exact same problem or that want to fight that are in my experience but we just don't know where they are um so i was actually at a point where i was sick of doing like I loved my job but anyway that's another story um but yeah anyway and I, I thought look I'm earning great money and earning a lot of money in doing IT but I'm just not happy um I was waking up every day dreading going to work rather than you know enjoying life um so at that stage I was like you know what I just want to fight I, I don't really care and I said to my boss I was like I don't even care if I have to go work at a service station I just I just want to fight so I quit my job and just got a job as a part-time receptionist. Um, but again, I sort of was like well, having trouble getting opponents. Um, so then, yeah, I just kind of thought, well, you know, there's got to be a way to, to be able to bring my um, technical skills in with um, into Muay Thai. Um, so I just thought, you know, I'll come up with a database um, that can help people communicate more and everyone can find each other. Um, and I know in the past, some other people had tried to do the same kind of thing, but what my plan was is that it was to be my full-time job, not to be a hobby. So that would always be kept up to date. You know, it wasn't just a, something that I was doing voluntarily. Mm -hmm. um, and when I felt like it, um, cause that was, you know, when I surveyed some of the public, um, you know, industry, that was the one thing they said, Oh yeah, people have tried to do it in the past, but it's never up to date. And it was just a waste of time. So um, I was thought, well, like okay, I want to kind of make this work. Um, so yeah. So then I basically, I did a business management course um, and learned how to, you know, run your own business kind of thing. Um, came up, obviously like I knew how to already knew how to do um, basic coding and, um, database design and that kind of thing so yeah I just came up with um, NRF and thought my favorite thing to do uh, as far as technically goes um, is automation so I love anything that's manual I love finding ways to make it automated um, and using different technologies to automate systems um, so yeah so that's basically I spend most of my time trying to automate con communication between fighters trainers promoters and fans as well um, so NRF is to be the hub where all those people can connect um, and the database is always kept up to date um, you know trying to make sure that we're always keeping on top of fight records for our members um, and yeah we have our members that um, each person pays a membership fee so if you're you can pay as a gym you can pay as a trainer uh, sorry as a fighter you can pay as a promoter um, and fans can just log on there for free um, and yeah basically I work for whoever is the member um, so let's say you're a fighter and you're a member I, do, I find you fights and I'm, I'll only ever talk to your trainer so I don't talk directly to fighters about matchups just because of it's not ethical to do that. Um, so yeah, I'll go out and, and put, check with your trainer first, say, uh, is Will um, available to fight these shows these months? And if he says yes, I go, yep, cool. Put his nomination there. Um, and if I'm working for the promoter, I'll try to find you uh, a suitable match. Um, or if I'm not working for the promoter and he can't find your match because you're the member, I'll still try to find you a match on that show as well. What's your phone um, and email? Like it sounds like you'll be bombarded with requests and calls and messages all day. Yeah, so I try to do as much as I can on Facebook Messenger because I like to keep record and have in writing exactly what rules were agreed to. If the promoter's talking purses, I want to have it all in writing. So my messenger is 
out of control. Like I get back and I've got a stack of <laughs> messages, um, also SMSs as well. Yeah. Um, I tend to try not to do too much on the phone just because also it does take a lot longer when I, all I need is a three second yes or no agreements. To I suppose the issue or, with phone is you want that record of what they said and what they agreed to. That's and right. Use that over the phone. That's right, because, you know, there have been times where people have said, oh, no, this wasn't what it was, and I've said, well, that's, there's the, the record that, that it was there. And it's the times when I haven't done that that something's gone wrong, and I've said, well, you said on the phone this, and then they, they said, no, I didn't, and I'm like, well, I can't prove it now because I haven't actually got a record of it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I like to put that in there. And in my database as well, I like to keep um, record there of what trainers have said about fighters as well. So let's say, you know, there's a fighter that specifically will fight up because they're quite strong, you know, at least I know that, or if someone's willing to pay for their own travel, I can let, let a promoter know that, you know, they may be looking for a specific fighter, but they're like, oh, I don't, I don't have the budget to fly anyone in, mm. but I know that that gym or fighter will fund their own travel. Um, at least I can then give that um, promoter the, the fighter as well. You've been around, you've been around it in the sport for a while, Melina. So would you say there was a challenge on onboarding the community onto your platform? Because back in 2008, 2009, most people were using the kickboxing forums and then moving to Facebook. It feels like there was that bridge, which is what, which is what you're trying to fill in. Did you find there was an issue or any challenges with that onboarding, initial onboarding process and like obtaining new people to try your platform? Yeah. So I found the, biggest problem is <laughs> everyone can't be bothered so like i made it really easy that everyone can just sign up online we think it's easy I... but there's always people that's going to complain about that yeah so i um when i did my trip around australia and i visited all the gyms um i when i spoke to people in person they kind of said oh i've been meaning to do that but i just couldn't be bothered but can you just do it for me because you're here now it's just like me oh i mean meaning to watch the video i'll subscribe to you but you know i'll do it yeah yeah exactly um so yeah you can make things as easy as possible but sometimes you know people and it's because people have got a busy life they're bombarded by so much incoming um advertising and you know that kind of thing that you know it does get a bit overwhelming sometimes and you just you've got other things to focus on so i mean you know if i just make a phone call and call someone say hey i can just sign you up online and you know I'll do it. But <laughs> um, the other thing I found was breaking into some different disciplines. Muay Thai were very accepting um, of what I was doing. And I, I think that was mainly because I had a good relationship with lots of people because um, I'd met them face to face and I'd talked to them. And so they knew who I was and they knew I wasn't some dodgy person trying to, you know, do a swift pull swifty on people. Yeah. Um, and people knew that I was an honest person as well. So um, yeah, Muay Thai I found uh, easy, but um, breaking into boxing and MMA, I found quite difficult. Um, they weren't as open or accepting of what I was trying to do. There have been certain people that have tried to help me uh, get into that area. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's been really good that I've had got some supporters in, in those disciplines. Are there any um, lessons that you've learned now about NRF that you wish you would have learned back then when you first started? Um, probably to stop thinking that, um, what I do isn't valuable. So I kind of thought a lot of the times like, oh, people, people don't really care or, you know, they don't want help or, you know, they kind of were a bit hesitant because it was me kind of thing. It was, and that was another thing too. I also kind of thought maybe because I was female that people would be like, oh, who's this chick? She's just no one, you know. Um, oh, I but, think you're very approachable. I think you're the perfect person for the bit. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's... And I kind of doubted myself a little bit just on that aspect. But so, like, I spent a, a good probably four or five years at the start of NRF pretending it wasn't me. I would just was... A, no, like I didn't put a name to anything. And if people thought that I was a male that they were talking to when they'd send me messages, I just let them think that. Um, but then after a while, I was kind of like because I did get feedback from people when they spoke to me. They're like, oh, I didn't know you ran that. Um, you know, if I'd have known that, um, you know, we'll give you a call or whatever. So, um, yeah, I realised that people do just want that um, interaction and do appreciate it that when that people do, that someone is taking an interest in, in what they're doing and wanting to mm. help better their career. So, um, yeah, I wish I had have not spent that first four years being so afraid of that because I struggled for four years to kind of get the momentum of it because I, I was can, trying to hide myself. I can sort of relate to that too with my name, WL5 Photography. In the early years, yeah. 
I tried to distance myself from not having it as a separate entity. It wasn't until the last few years where I've actually started to put my face to it. Uh, intertwine that to my personal work and with this podcast too, putting my face and voice to it too, so people know what I'm doing. And even when I'm at the gym training, I might get some people drop in other gyms and then they'll put two and two together. They'll see my photos on the wall and then look at me. Oh, are you so and so? I'm like, yeah, it's me. And I found <laughs> it just gives a more personal touch and it's more relatable too. I'm sure you've found that yourself. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that because, yeah, it's kind of, it is, it's a scary thing. I, I kind of thought, oh, you know, to be a business, and sorry, that's another thing too is I kept thinking I had to be very professional and because I came from a corporate background with my career um, being in IT and then before that I was a recruitment consultant. So I um, well, I had always had that kind of, oh, and then I was an accountant's office before that. So, yeah, very corporate background. So I kept trying to do everything and stress about things if things weren't spelt right or things didn't sound professional. But then the feedback I started getting from people, they're like, people like dealing with you when you're you, when you're not mm. trying to be Miss Perfect and trying to make sure everything is right, you know. So I've realised now that I can be myself and talk how I would talk to a normal person and not try to be a computer and type everything perfectly. Um, and that's why then when I started with my tour, I, I kind of thought oh, I'll do the flight stalker interviews, but then I was kind of a little bit like, oh, I don't really want to be on camera. And I was a bit embarrassed to do it because I'm not someone that likes to be. Oh, it just came natural to you. So I thought you were natural. Yeah, and that's why I just thought I'll just have a conversation with people and maybe that's going to be a little bit more comfortable. And the more, like you've probably found this as well, the more you do it, the more comfortable you would get with just having, you, you don't even think about the camera. You're just having a conversation to yeah. your mate. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Moving to here, the Melina Young Seminar at Nemesis Martial Arts. Now, the guys at Nemesis Martial Arts, Dennis and Phil, they put a lot of work into my fighting, my short-lived fighting career, but also shaped my photography journey along the way, giving me so much support along the way. So I'm always trying to give back to them, whether it be doing work for the gym or even teaching pre-COVID. And what was it like for you to run this seminar at the gym, having all those eyes learning from you? <laughs> that was quite scary, again, because I'm, I'm not a public speaker I find it quite daunting to stand up in front of people to speak about anything um, but I found though I didn't realize that if I'm speaking about Muay Thai and because I'm so passionate about it I'm it's actually comes quite easy to speak about it um, so yeah the guys at Nemesis were just so friendly so lovely so welcoming they really put me at ease that because when I first got there I was so nervous I remember when you walked in I was so relieved to finally like to be mm. able to have someone there that I knew and I was like oh god thank, thank god you're here <laughs> it's almost um, like me working at a show for the first time seeing the first friend okay I got someone to sort of catch me when I fall <laughs> That, yeah, exactly. That's it. Because I remember when I worked, walked in there, I was kind of like, oh, um, I, I thought there would only be like, I don't know, five people there. <laughs> and I, um, when I was speaking to the boys and um, when you came in, I, more people were kind of arriving next door and I could hear lots of people talking. And I was like, it sounds like there's a lot of people in there. And um, they were like, yeah, there's going to be quite a few people there. And, and I was sort of like shocked that when I walked next door and it kind of flooded over me that I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. What? <laughs> what am I doing here? What am I going to say? You know? Um, so when I got there, it was kind of, I, I was quite nervous to start with. Um, I wasn't quite kind of sure what they, what the people attending the seminar wanted. Um, and so in my head, I had thought, oh, maybe they probably just want to do some training. But then um, at the end of the seminar, we had a Q and A and that actually ended up running over time. So I didn't realize the people that were there were actually more there to ask questions and to hear a little bit about my experiences. Um, so I am a sort of a little bit sad that I didn't spend more time on that because the boys end up having to cut it short because some people had to go to work and leave. Um, mm. So they, they ended up saying, oh, look, we're going to have to pull it up there. Sorry to all the people that had the que more questions. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was still, it was so fun. It was such a good experience. And, yeah, everyone was awesome. It's very true to what you said. When you start talking about something that you're very passionate in, you can just ramble and you're not thinking about any nerves or anything else. In that moment, you just fix set it on that one topic. Yeah, that's it. And it's, and I guess because that was the other thing too, before the seminar, um, in the lead up to it, I was kind of like, well, I, what do I know? I don't know anything. What, 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 what have I got to say that anyone would want to know kind of thing? Um, but I don't realise that it's, you know, people are just normal people and, they just want to know what another normal person's doing kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
Now, moving on to our very last photo. It was not my photo. It's something I ripped off, but don't worry. The watermark's still in there. It was a still frame from our interview on the Flight Stalker. And I've got to say, I wouldn't have been in the game for so long if it wasn't for the support of people like yourself and Yolanda Schmidt when I first started, just supporting me, encouraging me to do what I do. And it was the first time of me being interviewed on camera just to talk about my story. It was great because, like I said, there was a familiar face talking to me. So I sort of had um, a support next to me. And I remember you kept nagging me to make, to revisit my old project, Way of the Fighter, which was using one of my old photos and overlaying it with a quote that someone said. It was a fun project while it lasted, but it was a good, I think it was a good concept, but the execution wasn't there. So I left, let it dry for a few years, but you kept saying, do it, do it. And I kept putting it off because I didn't think it was going anywhere. And just some ideas that just came from my mind, just wanting to learn new skills and push my comfort zone. And with your interviews and with that old project came the In Focus video series. It was a nice way just to put two and two together because I think I've got a pretty large collection of photos over the years of through people and what better way to relive it, relive it than relive it with the fighters and friends through this format, just to go over shared moments. Um, so yeah, that was my big projects that I did during 2020 instead of just staying at home and just watching Netflix in isolation. <laughs> Definitely That's pushed right. my comfort zones. I'm sure you had a similar experience when you did the Fight Stalker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And because, um, you know, I didn't really kind of want to speak to people, but then the more I started speaking to people, I, I absolutely loved it. And I realised that, it, you know, I, it, it didn't have to be that daunting thing of, oh, my God, I'm facing a camera and it's, you know, I made it more that, okay, let's sit side by side and just speak to each other. You know, and the camera's just a third person watching kind of thing. Um, yeah, and it became more and more relaxed and I never had questions scripted out or um, anything pre-planned. I kind of just would like to see how a conversation flowed and, um, you know, learn a little bit about the other person because I'm sure people, other people want to know that person's history and where they come from. And, you know, you had done such an amazing job with photography um, for the fight sport. Um, in, in my eyes, I think you're Australia's best photographer. And, I mean, it's not just me. You've Obviously, you've been voted that every year you know row pretty much or most years i should say um so yeah to be able to for people to be able to see that you know who you were because i knew like you said before you kind of never put yourself um yeah. in, as your name um but i just wanted people to see like hey this is where you came from this is what where, what's behind you that you did have a martial arts background as well and you weren't just a some random photographer that's you know just popped up um that you, this is why you've got that eye for photography in fight sport is because you know and I guess are used to seeing what people look like when they're about to do something or you know got something in planning for their fight moves and whatever they're doing yeah within the fight so um yeah I, I really wanted to have a chat with you and um find out you know a little bit more about you too it was a great platform but I think for myself as a creative too I'm very conscious about putting myself too much forward that makes sense. Mm. I didn't want it to be all about myself. I wanted to put my work instead of myself. And it was a, it was a very fine line between myself and my work, especially in the early stages. I didn't want to put my face out there. I didn't want my ego to get in the way. Yeah. But then over time, you sort of realise where your boundaries are and slowly push yourself forward. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's still like, you know, even now that I've done all of that stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm meant to have recorded a bunch of videos for um, just talking about NRF and I keep not, I keep putting it off because I mean, I've got everything here to do it, but it's just me. I don't, I just still keep getting a bit like, Oh, oh no, I've got other things to do. I'll go and match some fights instead and not focus on those sorts of things because um, yeah, it's that whole putting my face there and going, Hey, this is me. And I kind of want to hire someone else and get them to do it and them to say it. <laughs> Before I forget, your old fight name was Miss 24-7 because you're constantly on the go. Can you, well, back then, can you give an example of what a day, a day in the life was like? So um, Katie Reese actually came up with that nickname for me. Um, she did a write-up in International Kickboxer magazine and um, because basically I would, back then, I would wake up, I would um, go and train, do fight training, I would get home, um, start matching fights for NRF and promoting fighters and, um, you know, updating my database. And I'd go back to the gym and I'd work at the gym. So I'd work on reception and 
right back before that I was sort of training some of the beginners or the newbies that came into the gym. Um, and then I'd go back home and I'd work on stuff for Muay Thai Australia and Muay Thai Queensland, do some admin work for them um, and then match some fights again. And <laughs> that basically they would get me to like midnight and then I'd wake up in the morning and have to do it all again. <laughs> and, yeah. and so basically I did nothing but Muay Thai 24 seven, whether it was training or working. Um, yeah. So then when Kaylee did that write up, she came up with that um, nickname of Miss 24 seven. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I might keep, I might keep that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> and lastly, do you have any words of advice or words of encouragement for anybody involved in fight sports that wants to create a business about fight sports. Like you said, there was a few times where you didn't realize if, if it was, uh, there, there was a need for it. Yep. So I think, um, firstly, the one thing I did learn was that to run my own business as well as fight train is near impossible. I mean, you can do it, but if you, when you start to get up to a level where you're fighting people that are, very experienced um, to put in the hours that you need to train as well and put in the hours to run your own business. Um, what I should have done is had staff in place because every time I was in fight camp, my business would slow down um, because I didn't have the time to put into that. Um, but I think also just anybody that, you know, absolutely loves what they do. So if it's a sport, that you love what you do, martial arts, Muay Thai, you know, MMA, whatever. It's the best thing to be able to work in that sport as well as do it. Um, like right now I only train, I, I'm not fight training, um, but I, I still love it and I've got that passion for it and then I get to work in it every day and it makes me so happy to, when I match a fight, I'm as excited as if I just finished a fight <laughs> myself. I know that might sound weird, but the sense of accomplishment of being able to, allow another fighter to reach their goals and their dreams is something that I really cher cherish in what I do with my work. You know, it makes me so happy to see someone be able to go for that title shot um, that they've been wanting to go for. And maybe people don't know that they're there, but they've, you know, they're well experienced and well up there and entitled to have a title, but you know, they might come from a smaller gym or a smaller town in Australia that people don't know that they're there um, to be able to give them those opportunities or even give those opportunities for them to travel and fight interstate. Um, they're just so stoked after it and just makes you feel really good to be able to have been able to give them that opportunity as well so I think yeah anyone that's wanting to do something business-wise within martial arts do it because it, it's just good. it makes you very very happy like you you probably have the exact same I think the key word too. what you said was passion I mean I tell people I have the same passion as I do seeing a grassroots fight as I do a main event fight I'm still engaged in a fight whether it be 7 p.m at the start of the night or at 1 a.m because I'm passionate about the sport. I go home and I go straight to my computer. I review the fights because I'm passionate about the sport. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. I'm sure it's the same as yourself. Yeah, totally agree with that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Melina, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking your time out and having a chat. No worries. Thank you very much for having me on.